Hello friends, my name is Marines and today I'm going to be ranking all of the romance finalists in the Goodreads Choice Awards. I typically don't pay attention to the Choice Awards because it just ends up being more, I think, than most sort of like prizes and best of things like a popularity contest. What is the book that the most people have read? But this year I got a message from my friend Jess, who if you've been to BookNet Fest, you know Jess because I always put her on the romance panels and she was like really, really upset. <laughs> or like anticipating that People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry would win the category and she really didn't like it. So that inspired me to look up the category and I realized I had read five of the books in that category and I DNF'd one. I went ahead and finished the four books I hadn't read and I went back and actually finished the DNF and now I'm going to rank them all for you <laughs> according to a voter of one. <laughs> what should have won the category? I was going to like wait and surprise myself Myself to see what won, what actually won, but when I went to like pull up the nominees or whatnot, the winner was right there. So I already know people we meet on vacation won the category and nobody is surprised. Uh, where will it land in my list? We'll see. Number 10 and the worst finalist is The Spanish Love Deception by Elena Armas. This is about two work rivals who just don't get along. They're constantly sort of like bickering at each other, but the main female character, Catalina, is preparing to go back home to Spain to attend her sister's wedding, but she is dreading going alone because the best man is her ex-boyfriend and she just received the news that her ex-boyfriend got engaged. So she's showing back up after like this many years after the breakup, he's engaged and she's still single and she like left Spain with a broken heart. She kind of wants to bring a fake date and lo and behold, her professional rival, Erin, volunteers to go with her. Why is it number 10? <laughs> uh, first off, this was about 150 to 200 pages too long, if you ask me. I think that there was a way to make this a slow burn, like at least have the pacing of a slow burn where you really don't get the main characters together until the last like 25% of the book without having it be 470 pages. The first 200 pages of this were kind of a nightmare for me personally. One, because I'm super sensitive to repetition and this just went over things and the, the whole setup and the premise over and over and over and over again and being inside of the main character's head in that portion of the story for so long just made me not like her because it's very clear to the reader that there is something else going on between Catalina and Erin than kind of what they present that there are feelings involved there but she's just like dense for 250 pages and just like no this couldn't be which is fine to set up like a fake dating trope but in a limited amount of time the more you do that the more it made me not want to be with the main character the more frustrated I got with her and then on the opposite side of that it made Erin seem so stiff and and without a personality I love grumpy sunshine and I like main male characters who are a little stiffer or whatnot but this again went on for so long that I was like is he a person Person, does he have a personality? It becomes so much clearer in the second half of the book that that's really where the author was shining. I have this theory that there is one scene in particular that was probably either her favorite to write or like the first things she wrote and it was like better edited and better put together. But then everything else outside of like that one extended scene was just it needed more editing more care. There were other things with the editing as well. This was self-published and I believe English is the author's second language so it was relatively clean but again there were just really weird word choices that, that words that didn't make sense in the context that the author was using them and then the repetition again where she would just use a word three or four times on one page. The whole thing needed like a scrub down and there was potential there but I just ended up getting so mad <laughs> that it was so long and that it was so repetitive. Yeah, this one was not for me. Number nine is Neon Gods by Katie Robert. This is a Hades and Persephone retelling. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I say that lightly. I say that because that's what other people say. The two main characters are called Hades and Persephone, um, but they could have been called like Jack and Jill and the story would have been the same. The premise is sort of like, I don't know, there's a city and the names of the gods are like titles, right? So there's a Zeus that kind of rules over the city. He is not Zeus, but he is a Zeus. <laughs> 
<laughs> and and people get elected into these positions, but then they hold them for long periods of time. And there's like a lot of political intrigue between like all of the gods that are not gods. And then you have Hades, which everybody thinks nobody is currently holding the title of Hades, but he lives on the opposite side of the city and nobody goes there. Like nobody knows what's really happening there. Demeter, Persephone's mother, ends up like giving her to Zeus in marriage and she really doesn't want to do that. So she runs away. She crosses the river into the forbidden parts of the city and surprise she finds out that Hades is an actual person like somebody holds the title of Hades and so they make a deal where Hades is going to protect Persephone. So when this was like presenting like no it's just like people with these titles I was like okay okay and then the story kept going and I was like <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, mm, it's it's not that it doesn't make sense like I get what you're doing but it's just that I don't know the dynamics of it I wasn't buying the stakes of it and I just wasn't understanding like the motivation and the decisions that the characters were making primarily because like this setup of these like people with these inherited titles was really flimsy so the more that it kept going and the plot kept progressing and the higher the stakes were growing the more it became apparent to me that those like world props were were pretty flimsy also this is like not as long as the spanish love deception it's like 380 pages but it did not even have enough plot for that much story this felt more like a novella like again if she had stripped off 100 pages and like condensed it it would have been such a better story i like these two characters fine i think what happens is that we get them together almost immediately at the beginning and there isn't a lot of movement in the progression of their relationship it just stays really steady and so it's like we don't have a strong plot we're not really getting any character progression either there isn't any growth here like the characters are who they say they are they make a deal and they hold the deal to the end and it was kind of like okay I guess the answer to that okay is like the sex scenes but <laughs> This is weird to say in in a review, but I was kind of let down by by all of this because I, I feel like it set up this premise specifically about the relationship between Hades and Persephone and like the BDSM, I guess, aspects of what their relationship was going to be. And then it just like never really delivered on that. It kind of hinted at it. And then it was like, oh, no, not right now. And I was like, what do we do? I, I honestly don't feel like I ever answered the question of what exactly we were doing here. Overall, like I wasn't super impressed. Uh, why did I rank this above the Spanish love deception? Probably because one was 470 whatever pages and one was 380, so. <laughs> Good job, Katie Robert. Number eight is One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston. I was into it at the beginning and there were so many elements that I was like, ooh, nice, good. And those things kind of fell apart as I kept reading. This is a story about a 20 something year old girl living in New York City who's feeling kind of stuck in her life. But then she meets this girl on the train and like they instantly connect. But oh no, this girl on the train is actually like displaced in time. She is stuck on this train and she is from the 1970s. First off, this is a, another book that had pacing problems. The first half of this book, absolutely nothing was happening and then the second half it picks up and so I was really excited when we were actually doing things but it also served to like highlight the imbalance of like nothing 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 and then like boom. At the beginning I really liked August and Jane but as the story kept going their relationship made me a little bit uncomfortable. Jane is literally stuck on this train she can't go anywhere and because she is limited by like where she can actually be it starts to make her a very passive character. It feels like she's just stuck there and everything is being acted upon her and this is made even ickier by the fact that August is white and Jane is a woman of color and McQuiston like has this line where she's like this is not a white savior trope and I'm like you can't just say it and it's suddenly not a white savior trope and there were like other little lines that were like ooh, like cringy at best there's one time when Jane is like either sharing some of the homophobia or like the racism that she experienced in the 1970s and August says something like very flippantly like well things are not like that anymore and I'm like 
are they not? Like, it just felt like such a cringy line to have the white character telling the woman of color, like, don't worry, you're gonna get off this train and things are gonna be a-okay. More than anything, it felt careless. Like, McQuiston didn't really think about or explore the dynamics that she created between these two characters by making them who they were and putting them in the situations that they were in. And then another thing, at the very beginning, I enjoyed all of the side characters and like, they were very quirky and I I enjoyed that but the more that it went on the more one note that it became we get introduced to them and they're all wonderful but then as the story goes on they like pop up <laughs> these bike pop characters pop up just to like spout wisdom at august and then peace out so again cringy cringy at best and then finally the last thing that i was like oh like <laughs> It, it could have just not done this and it would have been better, is that we find out that Jane is somehow connected to August. The story could have left that piece out and just have it be, this woman stuck on a train, stuck in time, like what's the mystery? But when it started going too deep into that mystery and making all of these connections, I was like, why are we doing this? Also, I don't like it. It was a few enjoyable moments connected by like these smaller cringy things that just ended up like amassing into something that I was not entirely sure I actually enjoyed. Number seven is Actor Age Eve Brown by Talia Hibbert. I enjoy Talia Hibbert's writing and I enjoy a lot of her other series, but there's always like one or two main things in these Brown Sister books that I just, they're tripping points for me. And in this book, we're following the third Brown Sister, Eve Brown, and she's kind of a little lost in her life and she has this reputation of like not sticking to a job and just sort of being a little bit flighty. So she ends up at this bed and breakfast and she wants to interview for like the chef's job. But but the owner of the bed and breakfast is a, like persnickety with her but also she hits him with her car and so he now has to has to hire her because he doesn't really have a choice and he got hit by a car so he can't do it um <laughs> I'm doing all of these like plot summaries uh, from memory. So I guess that's like what you know going into the book and I guess you know they fall in love. So like here's the thing I totally did not get the chemistry between Eve and Jacob. Especially in the beginning of this, I didn't find their initial antagonism cute at all. Like the fact that she hits him with her car and it's like yuck yuck yuck. <laughs> Now she's got to stay here. I, I was not enjoying any of that. And then like when they become like, you know, employee and boss and that dynamic, I, I also didn't think that was cute at all. In general, I just didn't, I, like I didn't enjoy them being together for the first half of this book when I'm supposed to be learning to enjoy them being together. The second half gets better, much better with their relationship, but I like I didn't put any of the work in the investment. So it's just kind of like, boom, now they're better. The other thing though, is that like we start this book and I, I had to like sit and really think back to the previous two because it felt like we started it weirdly disconnected from the other two books. It felt like Eve wasn't the same character that I remembered. And we see her family at the end of the book as well. And they didn't feel the same. They show up in a way that was really forced. And then each of their interactions was also really forced. And then throughout the story, it feels like Eve is upstaged in her own book. She's just kind of like floating along. And we're told in the beginning, like Eve's a mess, but then she immediately gets a job and is really good at that job. And then that's kind of it. She doesn't have a character arc. There, she's just kind of like hanging out in the background of her own book. These were like my two main sticking points. The book did get better towards the end when they stopped being weirdly antagonistic towards each other. Number six is It Happened One Summer by Tessa Bailey. This is about like a rich socialite, social media influencer who gets in trouble for throwing a party and her stepfather decides enough is enough. So he cuts her off and like ships her back to the city where her father is from. Her father died and so she doesn't have a relationship with him but he did leave her like an old bar and so Piper decides that she's going to try and fix up this bar to prove to her stepfather that she is responsible and kind of get her life back so her and her sister go off and knowing nothing about bars or <laughs> fixing things they decide to take on this project we're getting into the like middle ground point of this list and that's that's how i feel about it happened one summer there were times that i really felt for her and like i thought that she was a sympathetic character and like her struggling to find her footing in life was a sympathetic sort of thing to drive her story but there were times that i was like okay rich girl 
<laughs> tone the complaining down a notch. So it left me a little hot and cold on her as a character. And then Brendan, when we first get there, he's like very rude towards Piper because she is like this rich socialite, but he's antagonistic towards her in a way that just made him seem like a jerk. Like that, it didn't feel like there was enough reason for him to be as aggressively mean as he was. That comes down as well. And there are a few scenes in here that were just delicious, including the shopping scene and the grand gesture at the end. I loved both of those. So there were times where their chemistry was really great. I didn't know this before coming into the book, but I read Tessa Bailey directly after this and I was like, oh, so Tessa Bailey is kind of known for her men who dirty talk. And so whether or not that will be for you, you know, you decide. I really didn't like it in the book that I read after. So Fix fix Her Up, I think, is the one that it, the context there made it even worse. Here was just a little jarring sometimes, but overall, I liked Brendan. I liked Piper. They just had low points for me as I was reading. And right in the middle, number five is the winner of this category, People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. So I went into People We Meet on Vacation with high hopes because of being treat and because I enjoyed Emily Henry's writing so much it's so juicy and delicious and I I was let down by this Ugh. the best way that I can describe it is that this is very much like a Hallmark movie in which you like enjoy it while it's happening but if you look back on it at all you start to realize <laughs> it's it's not that great uh, plot holes or like things like that and I think particularly for this one we read it for book club and so we sat around and we talked about it for like an hour and I was like oh like there are so many things here that aren't great and I think that primarily what happened here is that Henry tried to shove so many different tropes and things in here that it stopped making sense. The first few chapters of this were so incredibly cringe. The voice in it and the way that the character introductions were happening were so cheesy. I I, I was like dying reading the first few chapters. It does calm down but for a second there I thought I wouldn't even actually finish this book and I really like friends to lovers and I liked the main relationship here and how it progressed and some of the tropes that it explored like you know him taking care of her while she was sick like those are things that I enjoy it is a pleasurable experience if you just consume it and move on <laughs> And don't think too much about it, honestly. Don't think about how forced their like arguments are. Don't think about how one note the side characters are. Just enjoy the tropes and move on, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the, I mean, I'm telling you how best to enjoy it. My review is that the side characters were a little flat. And the, the, the conflict was a little bit forced. Uh, the, it was like one too many tropes going on. Uh, but overall, like the characters were enjoyable and like the, the base story, the root story was enjoyable. So like right in the middle of this list. Number four is The X-Hex by Erin Sterling. And this is a book about a woman who after she spends a couple months with a guy, he basically tells her that he has to leave to go because he's like engaged and he has to go take care of that. And so she, her heart is broken. And jokingly, she puts like a hex on him. She, her and her cousin are like drunk and they just kind of do it like in the moment and don't think anything of it until nine years later he's coming back into town because his family is the one who founded the town and they're having the founders day and so they meet up once again and there's all of this tension because of the way that they broke up and then things start happening that convince her that her hex actually works so they have to team up together to figure out what is going on. I was very pleasantly surprised by this. I think my expectations were low, so I was pleasantly surprised. I think that it did what it set out to do. And I think that the witchy vibes, particularly of the town that she lives in and her family were on point. Like I felt very immersed in all of it. And I went in expecting a romance, which it definitely is. But I was pleasantly surprised by like the additional elements. Like this is a romance book with a strong plot. I felt like it really took up the space that it needed to take up. I thought that the details were really interesting and it kept me hooked when we weren't kind of focusing on the romance and I enjoyed both characters. I don't think that I will come away with like a strong impression of either characters, but particularly not of the main male character. Like he was good, he was fine, but he wasn't like outstanding. There was nothing about him that I will 
like, oh yeah, I'll think about that guy all the time. He just slotted into his story incredibly well. He also could have taken off in the direction of some of these lower ones where he was like weirdly antagonistic for no reason or too much of a jerk, but he just wasn't. He didn't always do the right thing or like, you know, he didn't make the decisions, but he was kind of trying his best and you could tell that he cared about the main character even when they were getting their wires crossed. So I really enjoyed that as well and I thought they had good chemistry. So this was a pleasant experience. Number three is The Soulmate Equation by Christina Lauren. I haven't read a ton by Christina Lauren but the last thing I read was In a Holidays which was aggressively mediocre. So maybe that's why I was like tentative going into this but again I had a wonderful time. This is about a new dating sort of app that uses your DNA to like match you up. So the scientists have found that like people who are in loving, committed, long-term relationships have like certain markers that can predict according to them, like who would be your soulmate. And so our two main characters are two people who are like acquaintances. They've been going to the same coffee place like forever. And she's clearly very attracted to him, but he's like standoffish. But one day when they end up talking, he's like, oh yeah, I, I do this thing, this dating app. You should come by and check it out. So her best friend like drags her along and she does it out of like whatever I'm here I'll do it and it ends up pairing her with the grumpy scientist guy and their score is like unbelievable so the whole thing is like are they really soulmates are they going to give it a try or is the idea that like you know this this number has basically guaranteed them to work like is that influencing how they're together and I just I loved that premise so much I thought it was really interesting and it wasn't like super deep or like nuanced but it explored every avenue of that of like are we falling in love because we're falling in love or because we're being told to fall in love. I also really like that he was a jerk <laughs> at the beginning of this because like that's a romance thing but he immediately like kind of recognized and was like fixing his behavior and you could see that even though he was standoffish like you could see his personality immediately and you could see like why he acted the way that he did so I appreciate that so much more than like flat characters like Aaron Blackford back in the Spanish love deception. This felt like two characters I enjoyed and I really enjoyed them like getting together and getting to know each other and like exploring everything and they have a miscommunication breakdown but it was handled very well and like immediately they just start talking through it and then by the end of the conversation they're like okay we're back on the same page and it was just ah oh, so good it's so like fulfilling to have it like just be like hey this sucked and like have the conversation about it so that was great I also really like that our main character has a daughter and like her family around her was also and her best friend were fleshed out in a way that I enjoyed it just felt like a really full wonderful character so this was great we are down to the top two and I'm going to go ahead and tell you that they are probably basically tied for two and one I'll just lay it out here I think if we were gonna go with if this was a list of the best which I, I didn't really clarify to myself or to you if this was best or favorite either way I think it would still stack up the same way until these first two so if this were a list of the best number one would be seven days in June by Tia Williams and number two would be the love hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood if this were a list of my favorites I think the love hypothesis edges out seven days in June uh, but they're like, it's so difficult to compare them because they are so different. Let's talk about the love hypothesis. So this has a lot of hype and I will say that I read it. I read an ARC copy of this. So I had no idea that it was Raylo fan fiction. I just went into this and was charmed. I was charmed by this story. I read it in one night because I didn't want to put it down. I'm so glad I didn't know it was Raylo before I went in because that would have colored everything for me because I hate Raylo passionately. I will say though that like, this is Raylo in like, you know, alternate universe. Uh, you know, he's not a genocidal maniac at all. He's not murdering anybody. He's not torturing the main character. So is it Raylo? That, that's a separate conversation. That aside, I really, really enjoyed this. I think that it did all of the tropes that it had so well. I loved the pacing of it, the slow burn of it, and how they get together immediately. But there are just like these little nuggets of them being together, like hand holding and touching and kissing. And so we get like them together with an extended scene at the end. Um, it was just so charming in all of its details. Anybody who has ever been in academia, I think will find things here to enjoy. Especially like the commentary about like, you know, professors being 
mean for the heck of it and like the stress of being in higher ed. I love the subplots around their fake dating and this is another one where you have a grumpy male character but again he He's one that I can see if people didn't enjoy him, I totally get why, but he was right on the line of like, he's fine to me, particularly because he is sort of like this, you know, grumpy professor type or whatnot. So that worked for me. And I thought that the two main characters had such amazing chemistry. I thought that the writing and the characters were all witty and funny. And again, just charming. I, I had a great time reading this. And then you have Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. This is so well written. It is romance that I I think is like pretty unlike anything else on this list. It is a little bit dark because our main characters meet each other like at a low point in their lives and the beginning of their relationship is really unhealthy for a lot of different reasons. It does feel like heavier and darker but it also like it these characters wormed their way into my heart it, almost immediately. I was so stressed out even knowing I was getting a happily ever after thinking about like how they would end up together if they would be okay and just like all of the different uh, things that they had to deal with sort of in their lives individually and to be together. I also really enjoyed that in this one we see um, that the main characters had like friends and family that felt fleshed out and that added depth to the romance and all that it explored about relationships about growing up as people of color about being authors and like being in this industry as two authors of color about mothers and daughters and sort of like growing out of cycles about living with chronic illness like there were so many layers to this and on top of it I just wanted them to be happy and to be together and to kiss. So <laughs> it did the right thing about the romance. That there again, so many layers underneath it. Maybe talking about this, I've decided that number one is Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. Number two is <laughs> The Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood. I did it. I finalized my list. Number one is Seven Days in June. It absolutely should have won. And I think that if you haven't read this romance yet, just know that it is a little bit darker for some of the things that it explores but it is so well written it is so unique I think to everything that is on this list and I highly recommend it if you have read or would like to read any of the books on this list let's chat about them down in the comments specifically if you disagree with any of my placements I'd love to hear about it thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you guys soon